Before the class ends, I want to tell you a little bit about computational linguistics. This is a field that is at the intersection of linguistics and computer science. And by the way, to invite you to take the class. So compu computational linguistics is basically two things. First, computational linguistics proper is the study of the theoretical models that can explain human language. For example, the mathematical structures that we need to account for the complexity that we see in sentences, in phonological rules, and so forth. There's a second subfield called natural language processing, which studies how to understand human language and how to produce it or generate it. The understanding, for example, is in when you talk to your phone and then your phone has to try to find the nearest restaurant to you. The production is, for example, when a computer has to generate chat, as in a chatbot that interacts with you. Let's take an example. Uh, let's take a look at examples of how each of these work. So uh, when you talk to your phone and you ask your phone to play my music, for example, the computer is going to do something very similar to what we did in this class. It's going to generate a syntactic tree. We call this process parsing. Their trees might look slightly different than the ones we used in intro to link, but essentially it needs to find the verb, the head of the verbal phrase, which is play, and this is going to be the action that you want the, the phone to perform. It needs to find the direct object, my music, because this is what you want the action performed on. So there are many techniques in computational linguistics that are similar to what we have studied in this class. There are a few that are a little bit different. For example, there is a subfield called sentiment analysis to try to figure out, for example, if a movie review is positive or negative. You can see that we have a very short example here. Let's say we have a database uh, with a few reviews that we know are negative, like a movie is just plain boring or a movie is entirely predictable and lacks energy. And in the same database, we have examples of reviews that we know are positive, like saying that a movie is very powerful or that it's the most fun, fun film of the summer. We have these, and then we get a new review that we have never seen before, that a movie is predictable and boring. So how can we know if this is a positive review or a negative review? We're going to extract bits of information or features from the text. And we're going to try to figure out what makes a review negative, for example. So let's say that a review is negative if it has words like boring or predictable. We're also going to try to figure out what makes a review positive. Let's say a review is positive if it has words like powerful and fun. So if we have these features, these definitions of what makes a review negative or positive, we could then try to read the new review and try to figure out if it's more positive or more negative. This string, predictable and boring, has none of our positive features but two of our negative features. Therefore, we can predict that it is a negative review. This is called sentiment analysis and it's very useful, again, for trying to see if the uh, tweets that you're getting are positive or negative trying to see trying to separate for example um, real email from spam email then you try to find features of what makes good email versus spam email um, trying to figure out a dialect versus another trying to have features that define Arabic Arabic of Morocco versus Arabic of, Arabic of Egypt for example another type of, of extraction that we have is information extraction let's say we define some sort of rule that tells you that whenever you find the words is in, you're going to extract the element on the left and the element on the right. So Dartmouth is in Hanover. Hanover is in New Hampshire. So if we have these sentences, we will extract that there's a relationship between them. The relationship is in. So that Dartmouth is in Hanover. And Hanover is in New Hampshire. If we store these in a database, then we can do inference. We can try to extrapolate new information. For example, if we have the relationship that Dartmouth is in Hanover and Hanover is in New Hampshire, we could use transitivity and extrapolate that Dartmouth is in Hanover. So this is new knowledge that was not in the original text, but that we have managed to derive from existing knowledge. 
we can use information extraction to answer questions, for example. And this is something that um, your search engine is doing every day when you ask it a question. In general, what we need to do is try to model language, try to model uh, what a correct sequence of words of English is, or a correct sequence of, of sounds or letters of English. So let's say we're dealing with sounds, and we have the sounds that make up dog and cat. And we need to, and we want to make those words plural. So we need to figure out what plural corresponds to each of them. If we have the word dog, we learned from week three that um, after a voiced G, the plural should be the Z dogs. We also learned that if we have the voiceless T, the plural should be cats with the voiceless. So we need a system that understands that if it gets to a G and it wants to have the plural, it needs to go in this direction. And if it gets to a T and it wants to do the plural, it needs to go in this direction. We call this a language model that understands, a model that understands the sequences in human language. We can use these sequences, for example, to predict the following word. Um, please uh, pause the video and take a look at this sentence. What is the word that goes in the red line? Please pause the video. Mm -hmm. We're so close that we always finish each other's. So you know that we very likely said that you finish each other's sentences. Maybe if you know the joke from movies and TV, you say that you finish each other's sandwiches. But I bet you none of you said that you would finish each other's iguanas, for example. So a model needs to understand that it is very likely that this sequence of words will lead to sentences, that it could sometimes lead to sandwiches, and that it is almost never going to lead to iguanas. This is a language model. And notice that we're doing the model by looking at, at words that are adjacent to one another and sounds that are adjacent to one another. Others, sen sentences. This is something that we use every day. So many uh, text prediction models in your cell phone work like this. If you type TH, you're going to have the probability that the, the computer is going to display the words that could come next and is going to derive a probability for each of those. If you have TH, you're very likely typing the, but you could also be typing thanks. So those models that we saw depended on probability there was one element and then what follows, what comes next. But in human languages, sometimes you have dependencies that are very far away. Maybe you have a word here and its corresponding pronoun is in the next sentence. Maybe you have a word here and its corresponding dixis is three sentences down. Please pause the video and try to read this sentence and tell me what the element in the red line should be. Please pause the video. Yep. So I grew up in France and it was just an amazing childhood. We played on the street and hung out with all the other kids. So I ended up speaking fluent French. Notice that in order to predict what goes in here, you would need to know data from, you would need to have the information from 29 words before, and it is very complicated to make such a model. In order to do that, we have to transition to models that can deal with nonlinear relationships and non-sequential relationships, and we call those neural networks. Neural networks can have very easy architectures, very complex architectures, but in general, they can make predictions based on the data they have seen before. For example, this is called the InferKit, and it uses a kind of neural network called the transformer so that if you give it a sentence, it will try to write a story based on the sentence. So it will take the input, the spaceship entered orbit around the planet, and it will give you all of these words as the output, which are, again, predictions of what could come after this sentence. One property of neural networks is that they can match one sequence to a different sequence, and they can do so in non-linear, non-adjacent ways, which is very desirable for tasks like automatic translation. Take a look at these sentences here. We have the Chinese, um, which is equivalent to the English, what are you doing today? So the word what, for example, is at the beginning of the English and at the end of the Chinese. The word today is at the end of the English and at the beginning of the Chinese. 
When you say the word doing, this is equivalent to two words in Mandarin Chinese, zai zuo. So you can see that you, in order to transform one sequence into the other, you need to, first of all, do it in a nonlinear way, and also you might need to be paying attention to more than one thing. This here is actually called an attention matrix for uh, translation. So here we have a sentence in English that needs to be translated into a sentence in French. And the, the darker the color, it means that you're paying less attention. And the whiter the color, it means that you're paying more attention. So for example, when you translate the French word zon, you don't, you're paying no attention to the word agreement. And it makes sense because they have nothing to do with each other. But when you're trying, translating the word signé, signed, you are paying a lot of attention to the word signed, basically because they mean the same, but you're paying a little bit of attention to the word agreement because you need to figure out if this in the original English was in singular or plural so that you can have the proper verb in French. So neural networks allow for this kind of uh, nonlinear and multiple attention. Another uh, type of sequence to sequence transformation would be audio to transcription or automatic speech recognition. Here we have the frequencies for the spoken phrase, how much would a chuck, woodchuck chuck? And what the computer does is that it looks at a certain part of the uh, frequencies of the audio signal, and then it transforms that into an English letter. And again, it needs to be paying attention not just at the specific chunk of audio, but also at its neighboring chunks, which could influence the pronunciation of the letter, of the sound, I'm sorry, as we've seen in the weeks from phonetics and phonology. You can even do some very cool things like transforming a, a picture, which is a sequence of pixels, into a transcription, automated transcription. The computer could see these and then say that they are a herd of ze zebras walking in a field. There's a lot of cool things, uh, of cool research in natural language processing, but there's also a lot of work ahead of us. Please pause the video and look at the pictures and the, and the transcriptions that the computer gave for each of the pictures. Please pause the video. Yep, so a group of people standing on top of a beach. Um, learning can be very brittle in that it can, uh, the computer can be fooled by very small changes. And also many of these models lack common sense. So there's a lot of research into trying to incorporate knowledge about the world and common sense into the predictions. We also have the problem that these models spend electricity, they spend power, and therefore they produce CO2. So as you can see, training some of these models can be as bad as driving a car around. So we need to figure out a way to, to train them, but to train them with lighter models that consume less energy. And finally, one of the major problems that we're facing in natural language processing is bias. So for example, all of these models need to be generated, the computer needs to learn them, from existing text, for example, from previously existing books, from movies, from transcriptions of TV shows, and so forth. So if uh, your culture is producing these books and these um, shows, movies, and so forth, then whatever biases are in here are going to also collate into the language models, which is how you get computers that create associations between masculine names and words like leader and boss, and feminine names and words, words like helper and assistant. It's because the original training set had all these biases and they were imported into the computer model. And there is research on how to try to improve the situation because there is a lot of biases in the models. In summary, there's a lot of work to be done and there's a lot of cool research happening. So if you'd like to learn more, please join us. There's two classes at Dartmouth. There's Link 28, uh, which is for linguists, which requires no previous knowledge in programming, and Link 48, CS72, which is for uh, CS, but it only requires um, intro to programming, CS1, and it's being taught next spring. So if you'd like to find out more, um, come on and join us.